Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Kristen Martin, and I am the Electronic Resources Management Librarian at the University of Chicago and the host for today's event. Our topic today is GoKB eBooks Decision Support and Availability Tracking. We're delighted to have an opportunity to explore new developments in the global open knowledge base, otherwise known as GoKB. Our speakers will be presenting new ebook features and enhancements and share experiences based on the pilot project with libraries in the United Kingdom. After the forum, participants will have a chance to register for the pilot and, and can provide feedback on evaluation of the features. And today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website following the conclusion of the event. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, but we have muted everyone outside of the speakers for the sake of sound quality. However, we do value your participation. Please enter any questions or comments as they come to you in the question box within WebEx. You can do this at any time while the speakers are talking, and then we'll have a chance for conversation. You can also follow and participate in the conversation at Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum, but please note that we may not see your comments there during the forum. Our speakers today are Kristen Wilson and Ian Ibbotson. Kristen Wilson is the Associate Head of Acquisitions and Discovery at the North Carolina State University Libraries. She manages the department's serials unit and has been involved in the development of a local electronic resources management system and the global open knowledge base. She has published on the topics of knowledge bases, electronic resources management, and workflow analysis in journals such as Serials Review and Library Resources and Technical Services. Ian from Knowledge Integration is the, is the technical lead for the delivery of KB Plus and GoKB and is also working on the KB slash catalog modules within the Folio product. He's been developing systems and bibliographic services for libraries since the early 1990s, working primarily on distributed systems, interoperability, and interlibrary lending. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, who will do an introduction about GoKB. Thanks, Kristen. Can everyone hear me all right? Sound good to me. Okay, thanks. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for coming today to this forum. Um, I'm really just going to be giving a short introduction and Ian is the one who you're going to want to listen to most during this presentation today, um, but I'll be here for questions and then we also have Jennifer Solomon, who's our GoKB editor here to answer questions as well at the end as well as Ian. Um, but basically before Ian gets started, I just want to give a little bit of background about GoKB and the connection with this project for people who aren't familiar with it. So GoKB is a, a project to build an open data e-resources knowledge base. So um, if you're familiar with e-resource knowledge bases in general, it's uh, very similar in that it's a collection of data about titles, both journals and e-books, um, packages, the way that they're bought and sold, um, and other metadata and organizations who are involved in that process. Uh, GoKB is community managed, so we have um, librarians who help us work on collecting and curating data for the native knowledge base, and it's completely open data. So um, everything that is in GoKB is available uh, CC0 for uh, use for any purpose. So if people have more questions about that, um, we can maybe talk about that after, or uh, you can feel free to email me or Jennifer as well. Um, I do want to say just a little bit about our connection with JISC, since this um, eBooks project really uh, has most of its work uh, based at JISC. And so JISC is a group in the UK who works on issues for libraries and higher education. And GIST, GIST Collections was one of our original project partners for GoKB. They helped us work to design a data model that was used both by GoKB and KB+, which is the knowledge base and ERM that JISC runs. And so um, this ebook pilot project was really came out of a, a report that JISC did uh, called the eBooks Co-Design Report that was um, uh, designed to identify pain points when it comes to the management of eBooks. And two of the biggest points that arose out of that report were the need to track eBooks and the need to 
perform decision support. So tracking basically means knowing what ebooks are in which ebooks package and being able to be aware of when changes are made to the contents of different packages. So knowing if a package is losing significant contact, content, knowing if a particularly high value title is moving out of a package or into a new package, that kind of thing. And then decision support is basically making sure that um, you have the information you need to purchase the ebooks that are right for your institution. So that can be things about the platform, what features are supported, what rights are allowed, whether or not that platform works well. And so JISC wanted to explore uh, methods for addressing those two issues. And so they launched a pilot project and they uh, basically the goal was to see if GoKB could be adapted to support these needs for ebooks. So Ian has uh, worked on the development for that and then um, a number of others uh, related to JISC have been working with UK libraries to get some testing and feedback of these new features done. And I believe uh, right now that they're at a point where they're sort of deciding whether or not to take this further than a pilot. And I'm actually not sure the most current status of that conversation. Um, Ian may have more details. But at this point, I do want to say that there's no guarantee that this project will become a production environment or if it does, if GoKB will continue to be the platform for it. That's all kind of under discussion right now. Um, but we will be incorporating some of this ebook functionality into GoKB. Um, one of our goals has always been to support journals and ebooks. And so we're pretty close to finally having our um, release that will include ebook functionality. So that will be something that we have more information about soon. But I think that um, the work that Ian is going to present will be really interesting to consider from a knowledge base perspective in general and for the use of knowledge bases in some of the Folio apps that are being developed. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Ian to start his part of the presentation. Thank you, Kristen. Just uh, wait for someone to pass me the ball. Ah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be going through uh, a presentation and possibly dipping out to uh, to the application live, which means I'm not going to be keeping an eye on the chat channels. Uh, Kristen, Jennifer, could you keep an eye on those? And if any questions pop up, um, holler at me uh, audio-wise. No problem. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? There should be a slide saying GoKB Books DS and Availability. No. Oh, <laughs> right. Hang on a minute. Uh, where is share my screen? Let's try that again. Got it? Yes, it's available now. Yep, we can see it now. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was me. Uh, right. Okay, okay. So, um, as Kristen said, I'm just very quickly going to go through uh, these two bits of functionality and then I'll finish off with a, a status update on where we are in terms of how we think this is going to be taken forward. Kristen already has been over this, but uh, just to, to cover the ground again. Uh, decision support. There's a large uh, collaborative effort um, trying to share the load of documenting, for example, Shibboleth support on different platforms. And there was a recognition in the UK that there was quite a lot of duplicated effort um, when it came to figuring out what was working where, um, presenting a unified front to vendors to say, look, guys, uh, your PDF support on this platform, you know, iOS devices really sucks. Please, can you sort it out? Um, so the decision support um, not only trying to formalize the kinds of questions that we might ask when we're trying to evaluate a platform, also gives us an opportunity to, to work together as a community um, and also to bring the vendors in, so to get the vendors input into problems. So I'll, I'll show you some of those features. Um, but it's very much intended to be a bit of a commons where both the e-resources staff and the vendors uh, collaborate and, and express problems that they're having. As Kristen said, availability tracking is much more about figuring out this idea of 
what we've loosely termed churn in packages of ebooks data. So whether uh, how often books come and go from a package, whether or not things which are important to us, uh, and we've you know, once again, overloaded the term core titles to mean things which are very important to me. Uh, are they appearing and disappearing from from packages that are important to me? There was a, a question about specifically high demand print use, uh, and I've got some examples I'll show you there where libraries were interested in um, where they're trying to do collection weeding and they've got significant portions of shelf space uh, for print only. Uh, they'd like to upload watch lists so that they know the moment there's an electronic version of a text available because they might like to consider freeing up that shelf space. So this idea of tracking the availability of new items uh, was quite a hot topic. And actually, interestingly, we had the vendors in the rooms and the vendors got quite excited about this as well because I think they saw it as an opportunity to you know, spot high value targets for new digital titles. But, but that was kind of a win-win situation. So, so there were some good things and, and the vendors participated in this process uh, very enthusiastically. So I, I wouldn't want to characterize it as antagonistic in any way. I don't want to get too deep into the, the technical parts of this. But just to say that the changes to, to GoKB, if you like technical diagrams, if, you, if you're a UML fiend, uh, some people are. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse moving on the screen. Yes, we can. Yay, cool. Uh, it's terrible when I, I sit here talking as though people know what I'm pointing at and nobody can see it. So on the left hand side, we've got uh, GoKB as it, as it was in traditional land. Because we were focused so much on serials, we just had the idea of titles um, and, and titles were serial titles. And obviously we had tips, which were titles in packages. When we moved to the ebooks work, um, specifically it became apparent that we were going to need to differentiate titles as, as monograph and serial uh, because they got different kinds of properties and, and sometimes different behaviors. So in the um, ebooks branch of GoKB, titles have been extended in this particular way. And the other major change is that we've introduced the concept of a work, which is a very bib frame construct. And when we get into availability tracking, and in particular, Discovering the availability of print versions of, uh, sorry, electronic versions of print works. Um, the work context is very important to us because this is the way that we can navigate from the print version of something to the electronic version of something. So those are the kind of changes that we've been seeing in GoKB. There have been a few more than that, but that's the, the major thematic change, if you like. So to look specifically at what we did in GoKB regarding decision support, um, some universities in the UK had already put together an Excel spreadsheet where they listed in categories things that they felt were important to ask um, about e-resources generally. Um, so we had a list of things that we thought were important. So you can see some examples on the screen here. Under license terms and conditions for access, uh, does the license uh, specify the download allowance? Does the license specify the copy allowance? Does the license specify print allowance? These are all questions that we might start to ask in, in this context. One of the things that we weren't sure about was whether or not we record that at title level, at package level, or at platform level. Um, so we we set because of the way GoKB works with its components, it, it, it turns out to be very easy to be able to express this information at any of those levels. And actually, for different use cases, different things are, are useful. So what we found is that when it comes to evaluating um, the broader context. Platform level is definitely where e-resource staff want to be recording this information. They want to make descriptions about the platform. When it comes to supporting users, you know, uh, when the, the user walks into the library desk and says, I can't access this title, that's very much a title level problem. And the direction of one of the conversations was very much when it comes to supporting individual users, it might be useful to specify at the title level something's gone badly wrong. So 
the diagrams in this book are not displaying uh, using the iOS e-reader, for example. Whereas for decision support, actually, we're still at the package kind of level. That's, a, that's too granular for package level dis, uh, decision support. But for supporting users, that's still quite useful. What we found is that we, we've got 106 criteria. Um, and originally, we didn't have 27 categories. We had about 17 categories. And we found that it was just too dense. Um, there was too much information in the categories for somebody to be able to say, you know, I've got 15 minutes now. I'm just going to fill out the, uh, the license terms and conditions authentication section for this platform. So one of the changes we've made and one of the lessons we've learned is that we need more categories. Um, so just to, I'll pop into the app in a second, but you can see that these bars are where we've rolled up the individual categories. Uh, and this is an expanded category here. So the idea is when it comes to data entry, a user will hop in there and say, you know, I've got 10 minutes. I'm going to fill out the access terms and conditions for this platform, expand this tab, and then they can just go click yes, no, yes, no, put comments in where they're not sure. Another problem is the, the device family versus functional area problem. Um, you'll see when I go into the app, some of the categories, for example, represent Android or iOS or other device types. We had a discussion about whether or not uh, the matrix was two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So we have all the platforms on one axis, and then we have the criteria and the categories along another. Should we have a third category in back, which is the kind of device family like iOS um, or Android you know, or whatever's going to be coming next year? And in the end, the users felt that that was going to be too complicated. So what we've ended up with is the, the categories being used to group together platform-specific things. I still feel this is a bit of a, a bit of a clutch, but it kept it simple, and that seemed to be really important to the user community. Uh, so this idea that you can just hide everything and just expand the thing you want to see became quite important. In terms of visualizing the output of this, um, this was how we, we thought users would both input and review the information. Um, that was just too painful. So I'll, I'll show you the grid we came up with um, on that. We'll skip that slide because I've, I've talked for too long. So specifically on, on the, the problem of data entry, um, we can do this at the title, package, or platform level. But there's a strong preference platform level data entry for doing decision support. Um, commenting was quite important. The ability for vendors to feedback in line was quite important. So th those are the, some of the things that we were thinking about. I've got a slightly annotated uh, picture of the interface here, but we'll, we'll look at it live in a second. Um, this is the standard GoKB package display. Uh, so we have all our package details. There's a new tab in the, the eBooks branch called Decision Support, in essence. And under Decision Support, uh, we can filter the various lines by people who are curating the data, only people in my library, or the library staff, vendors, or everyone. So, pardon me. These were the, the ways that users felt it was useful to filter down this information. And then we've got, oh, pardon me. We've got the various categories rolled up, as I said, so that users don't have to deal with the detail of the criteria. They can just look at the category and say, oh, I want to deal with authentication terms and conditions today. If I expand the license terms and conditions, uh, what I get is this section where the criteria, each criteria is in its own box. And I just vote. Um, originally, we used the term vote, but the users didn't like it. Um, and we ended up with rating. And I still don't know how, how people feel about the terminology, really. Uh, a user will rate a platform. So if I think that this platform, let's have a look, what is it? So this is Elsevier. Um, if I think that this platform supports easy proxy, then I can just say, yes, it works in our organization. That's great. If I'm not really sure, if I'm having problems with it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, we've got this question mark. And we have an informal rule that says if you use the question mark, you should really put a comment in there to try and explain what's going on. 
If you think it really doesn't work, then you can say no, it really doesn't work. Um, up here where users make comments, we've got obviously the username, and then we've got some affiliation data. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a better example of that in a moment. And then over to the right, because I'm an administrator, I can essentially moderate comments, I can get rid of them. Uh, We've never had a problem with inappropriate comments, um, but who knows. Users can like comments. So one of the things that we found was if, uh, you know, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, suddenly um, easy proxy authentication is broken, um, the user will come along and, and change their tick to a cross and then, you know, put in here and say, easy proxy, it's broken, you know. Uh, 458 Saturday the, the 20th and what we didn't want then was a whole string of comments saying me too me too me too uh, so we've got this like which is a very Facebook type thing uh, and, and this turned out to be really useful so for the vendors as well if you see that comment at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and suddenly you know it's got 300 likes you know that probably something's broken in your service and I don't know if that's shortcutting the support desk for the vendor or not, but it, just giving people a way to express that seems to be quite useful uh, and it seems to take some of the sting out of it. And the vendors expressed an interest in, in being able to use this as a means of communicating. So, you know, a uh, hundred users have said this is broken for me and the vendor can come along. And it, sh it shows that they're a vendor in this affiliation section and the vendor can say, we know it's broken, we're, we're working on it. So that was seen as being, uh, a real positive from this. When it comes to actually visualizing this output though, so each user's been in, um, we've got this section here that says no one else has rated yet. As of the user's rate, you'll see how other people are scoring this. So if in my institution, Easy Proxy isn't working, but I can see that, you know, there are a hundred other users who said this, this is working for me, I might, you know, I might feel differently about that if everybody else has said it's not working for me either. So that's quite useful as well. It gives you a way to say, you know, this is working for most people. So maybe, maybe I need to go back and look again internally. Or this isn't working for anybody. We need to shout at the vendor. As I said, we, we planned on this being the way that people access the information, but it's just not really great. If you're wanting to get a feel for the support levels of Easy Proxy across you know, all all vendors. Um, that's not ideal. So we we came up with this, and as I said, some of the universities in the UK had already got um, a, an Excel spreadsheet where they were putting this information in, and this layout is very much inspired by that spreadsheet. And and so what we've got is um, an ability to switch between a, a platform, a title, or a package view but nobody ever does uh, because people are only interested in platforms, as it turns out. Um, I can filter the list of platforms, so I can say only show me the ones that have got, you know, Springer in. Obviously, that would only be one, but um, if I need to. And then I can, I can filter which categories I'm interested in. So it might well be that I'm really only interested in the license categories or I'm really only interested in the uh, platform reader categories. But what this layout gives you is a very, very quick visual cue as to how, how the different platforms are scoring across the different um, criteria. So you could get a, a feel quite quickly for easy proxy support by just looking down this column and seeing, you know, are they all green? Are they all red? Uh, obviously the orange ones, are they? I'm not so sure. We've had some ideas about how to improve this, how to visualize this a bit better. So maybe, um, maybe there's a bar rather than the, the counts and the bar shows different percentages based on people who voted yes, no, or unknown. Um, so we've got some uh, some feedback on ways to improve this visualization. This particular layout, uh, the screenshot was taken from a dev system, why it's not, uh, that's the reason it's not particularly well populated. Um, but this layout, when it's populated, gets the users quite excited. Uh, they really like this idea of being able to see it at glance. Generally speaking, what's embedded PDF support like across the platforms, for example, um, and, and for taking decisions at a higher level than just an institution, perhaps. So for, for JISC, who often negotiates on behalf of the whole of UKHE, um, that's, that's quite an interesting uh, lever 
because if you're talking to a vendor and something isn't working, you can now point to the screen and say, look, everybody else has managed to make easy proxy work. You know, maybe, maybe you should get your act together. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on there. Just going to see, can you see a GoKB screen for me? Anybody tell me? Yeah. Yes. Yay, cool. Okay. Um, so what I'll just very quickly do, oh, there we go, log in. Um, the eBooks branch looks different to the standard GoKB branch. So the, the front page in the standard GoKB branch uh, is some graphs showing you how many titles and packages and organizations there are. Uh, it's different in the eBooks branch, and we'll, we'll get to all the stuff on this screen in a little while. But just to, to show you all the stuff I've just been talking about, um, if I go into packages, so I went to platforms, didn't I, not packages. Uh, so we'll go into uh, link.springer.com, here's decision support, and you can see uh, I've been in here uh, collecting various bits of data. Uh, if I just, we've got a new tab, decision support dashboard, so that's how I get to the, the thing I was just showing you. Um, link.springer.com, so we, we've not got anything under license terms and conditions, license details. So if I go into there. Uh, license details. So this is the section where I've not got any ratings. And the idea is that users will, if it's all just working, you know, data entry should be as simple as this. Um, but if it turns out that for some reason there are, there are problems with off-campus access, uh, I'm going to say no, it doesn't work. And I'm going to say um, being told is not apply. I'm going to comment in there, um, and then hopefully we should see here's the big red standing out like a sore thumb. Uh, and so this is all very real time, and uh, maybe even it's something that you might watch. And as I said, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, if you if you start seeing the, the it's not working uh, rocketing up, you might you might start to get a bit twitchy if you were uh, a vendor. Just to uh, to go back here, uh, the other thing that I was going to just show you, which didn't come out in the screenshot so well, um, obviously I'm logged in as admin. In an ideal world, I'd be logged in as a real user, so it would say uh, Ian Ebertson. I've got my organization name, and GoKB has always had the, the concept of a mission for organizations, so that turned out to be really neat because um, we've just adapted that as the way that uh, if a vendor is putting comments into the system, we use the organizational mission uh, commercial or vendor. Uh, so library staff using this can get a very clear view that the comment just put in here came from a vendor, you know, and who that vendor was, and it's not other library staff. And of course, then you can use the filters to not see vendor comments, to just see library staff comments on me. So uh, that's what's going on there. Um, yeah, good. I don't know if you want to save your questions up to the end or, or feel free to, to ask as we go. Um, that's the majority of decision support, of, of the functionality around decision support that we've been rolling out. Um, the a uh, few other things perhaps worth saying. Here, a couple of new GoKB categories, uh, DS category and DS criteria. So these, these are the categories and the things inside the categories of the criteria. And if I go into DS criteria, uh, let's look at TNC authentication. There's um, a screen that makes it really easy just to add new criteria to this. Um, so the idea was that this wouldn't be a static thing. Uh, the criteria and, and the categories, we saw these as evolving over time. Uh, and so if there were a new device type or a new a new format, uh, the idea was that users would just collectively, so you wouldn't just dive in here and add things, but collectively you would say, you know what, there's this new thing replacing EPUB, we really need to be able to document that. So you would do that in this model, uh, it would dynamically add the field. So having done that, me, 
having done that, um, those things would just dynamically appear here. So you could very easily add new categories. That's decision support. Done that to death. Um, the, the slightly more interesting stuff, I think, from my perspective, is availability tracking. So the ability to know what electronic items are being made available uh, and which ones are disappearing as well. Some of the challenges in this work then. Um, in GoKB to date, we've used OpenRefine, which is just a, a fabulous tool for cleaning up messy data. Um, but the level of change for the ebooks data is problematic. Um, it's very difficult to imagine how we get to a situation where um, manually we could import these packages every night. They do change every night, and there are a lot of them. Um, as I said, we've introduced the concept of a work. Uh, so this is figuring out the, the common header, if you like, for a group of title instances so that we can know that this is the electronic version of a print, for, uh, print item. Um, so that, that's been a problem, but, but it's been a fun problem. One of the other problems that we found in ingesting files from vendors is, is it's very, very common now, particularly with a couple of the vendors, to mix um, item types, so monograph and serial items, into subject or thematic files. So it's not the case that we were um, getting KBART files that were all serials or all books. What we're seeing are KBART files which are using item type and then mixing item types. Uh, so that's that's really great, and it's great that item type is there for us now but it means that we've got to be careful as we read the files because, of course, um, in KBART you have print identifier and electronic identifier, which means that when the item type is monograph, that means a different thing to when it's serial. Um, so that, that's a problem. And because the data changes so often, setting up repeatable tests can be tricky as well. Um, users were very interested in this concept of watch lists. So here's my high demand print use list. Um, I'd like to upload it. I'd like you to tell me as soon as an electronic version of anything on that list comes available. Um, that's, uh, oh heck, we need a format for ingesting title lists. So we ended up uh, adopting various standards for, for doing reading lists, which the, the libraries in the UK loved because a lot of them have got software for managing reading lists. And I think they just, um, adapted it to this purpose, if you like. So we, we've got some pretty standard uh, TALIS list output, and uh, we load those as title lists. I'll, I'll go through that later on. The vendors have been great uh, in terms of the electronic uh, and nightly updating. They've all given us access to their, to their systems. Uh, nothing special, but, uh, but they have given us access, and they've been very willing to cooperate. So uh, I take my hat off to the vendors on that. They've been very good. In terms of what we, we think we've achieved, um, the automation uh, has, has been a real eye-opener. Uh, in KB Plus in the UK, we load items. We don't use Google Refine, but there's a lot of tidying up of spreadsheets. Um, and this project has been an opportunity to go back and revisit whether or not it would be possible to automate loading some of that. and. I think we've made some substantial steps forward in, in how easy it is or how possible it is to, to automate this loading. There are still problems, and I'll, I'll talk through some of those. We've made some good steps forward in the performance of that as well. Uh, so we can get up to a, you know 100,000 titles an hour now, which is where you need to be if you're you know on a nightly basis reloading everybody's packages of work so you can figure out what's gone missing. Uh, so that's interesting. The workflow around that and detecting problems has been interesting, but fortunately GoKB already had some great methods for, for logging problems and logging review requests, so we've managed to exploit that. One of the really exciting things, of course, is that we've taken lots of vendor-specific or proprietary ways of publishing package files, so you've got Wiley's FTP service and that, you know, their particular format, and then you've got other services which have got websites where you download things in a different package format. Um, we've taken all those proprietary things, put them into GoKB, and what GoKB spits out the other end is pretty much uh, 
a standard OAI PMH service that you can talk to, you can get metadata records that are common and consistent, and they're openly licensed. So we've got a really good way of going from those proprietary uh, silos that vendors have through to a, a stream of, look, they're just packages supplied by vendors and you know packages of titles. So I, I think that's been quite exciting, and and I know that there's interest in other areas, particularly in Folio, for example, where the bridge between the catalog and the knowledge base is, is a particular focus of work. And these kinds of services are, uh, are very much at the fore of the thinking there. We've had at least one pass over all the major vendors uh, that were, were interested in the UK, with one exception who are uh, working very hard on getting their electronic interface up for us. Uh, and, and they've been working with us, uh, so even though they've, they've not published the data yet, um, they've been really good, so that's good. These services nightly contact the services and get updates, so that real-time updating that was very important. Uh, we've, we've made solid steps forward there, and, and that, that's working. The adoption of the, the work instance item model, GoKB traditionally is, is really set on the, you know, the instance part of this. Um, we've extended in this direction towards works. That was important. Um, we're not interested in items, really. That's more an ERM thing. KB Plus is pseudo interested in this. Uh, GoKB to a lesser extent, or, or not at all, really. But the adoption of this model was um, really helped us to deliver some of the functionality to do with alerting and detection of, uh, of new electronic items available. Really great engagement from the community and from the, the vendors, can't really uh, fault that. And email alerting seems to be the thing that people have got quite excited about. Um, they, love, they love GoKB, they love seeing the demos, but they really love getting an email saying, you know that core title which is on your reading list? It's not available anymore. Uh, so that's the that's the thing that, uh, that people are getting excited about. I want to talk a bit about the process. So this uh, apologies if this is boring. Um, GoKB had a, a very Google refined process that's very very user intensive, um, and that's not a bad thing uh, because the knowledge that you need is. There's no way to get around the fact that a lot of these package files are ambiguous and it takes a human to, to figure them out ultimately. But we needed to come up with a way of doing that that could work on its own or could work unattended when we knew all the rules. So what we have is this, this new workflow, which was designed for eBooks, but it turns out will work equally well for the, the serials. And a lot of this work was informed by conversations that GoKB have been having about other ways to ingest data and do bulk regular updates of things like cuffed data. So out there in the cloud, we've got vendors with with different, uh, I, I use the word proprietary not in a, a negative way, but obviously everybody has their own features, they've got their own way of doing things. Um, so Wiley, for example, make their data available to us through an FTP server, and the way that we know there's a new package is that there's a new file on the FTP server, and the way that we know that a, a package has been updated is that that file has changed on the FTP server. Um, sometimes there's a new name, but that's okay. Some other vendors, we visit websites and we basically pretend we're a browser and we talk to the website to get the links for the package files and then we download the package files. The, the point is that what this layer does here is understand how to talk to the vendor structurally. So it's not just about the data, but it's about understanding how we figure out new packages and updated packages. Then we turn those packages into some kind of canonical format, which is very KBART-like. Um, it's not just KBART, because it turns out we need a few extra columns and a few extra fields, as you do. Um, but what gets passed over this interface is something which is more standardized that we can, we can handle. So this thing will, if it's the first time it's run, uh, it will just tell us about a whole lot of new packages. If it's the second time it's run, what it will do is walk through the full tree of of packages available at Wiley in this case. Do an MD5 checksum on all the packages and for all those that have changed since we last looked, send them over to this interface. And so after the first time, 
the first time is painful. After the first time, this is quite efficient, actually. Um, it's a problem, obviously, because the old titles package changes a lot, and that's the one that's got all the titles in it. Um, but at least you don't have to deal with the other 900 packages which are in there. So it's actually pretty good. So the submission interface accepts package files which have been homogenized, if you like. We've got them into a format that we can use. Passes it into a pre-flight step. Now what the pre-flight step does is to take our existing rule base and our existing set of knowledge and apply that to the data that's coming in and say, have we passed all the tests? Does, is this data consistent? And uh, just as I was trying to work out my spiel, I, I realized that consistency is probably the watchword of what we're doing here. We don't, we don't say that identifiers are any more important than titles. Um, there's no primacy. But what we do need is to know that the update we're going to make to the knowledge base is consistent. And if it's not, we really need the help of an e-resources librarian who understands what sorts of mistakes have been made. The problem, of course, is that the error might not be in the data file we're loading. The error might be in the knowledge base in something we loaded yesterday, but we couldn't tell it was a problem. So we go into this pre-flight step and basically, will the effect of, of loading this file be consistent? And if it will, we go on to an ingest phase and we're confident at this stage that we'll be able to load the data. That's really great. If it's not, then we go into this thing where, heck, we've got a list of problems with this file that we need sorting out. So they go into GoKB's standard review request mechanism and then at some point, uh, poor old Jennifer, sorry, uh, has to come into work and look at the request for review and say, oh, you know, there are 20 files in here that have got problems. I'm going to have to sort them out. Uh, You'll see the interface in a second. Jennifer goes through and says, right, uh, this is how you fix this problem. This is how you fix this problem. Hopefully, she doesn't encounter a problem that the interface doesn't know how to fix, because if she does, then we need to have a conversation and we need to expand the way that we know how to deal with error scenarios. Uh, but that's OK. Hopefully, we don't. Tomorrow, this process happens again, or the file gets resubmitted if it didn't work. We go through the pre-flight with the new rules, hopefully then, applying the rules that we've got, it's all consistent and we can go on to the ingest step. We might then do this process, uh, you know, for, for 10 weeks, everything would be wonderful. And then on that 10 week and one day thing, uh, somebody updates something in here, it goes through this process and crunch. There's something inconsistent in the data that we don't know how to fix, even given all our rules. So we don't load the file. We send the problem review up. Poor old Jennifer cops for an unfortunate one again, has to figure out how to fix the problem. And it might involve fixing the knowledge base rather than the file, because that's you know a valid way to make it consistent. It tells us what the change is. And then tomorrow, when we re-ingest it, everything's OK. So hopefully, uh, what we've done with this model is to make it so that the e-resources librarian is involved when we've got questions to ask. But the process isn't you going and downloading files every night, uh, you know, and then running them through Google Refine. What we're trying to get is this pipeline running on its own, and then this feedback loop going when we really do need help from a, an expert who knows how to fix these kinds of problems. Um, so just to... Uh, to quickly go over again, what these things are doing, they're actually figuring out how to talk to Wiley for the whole list of packages. It's not just a one package thing. It's, it's about the set of packages which is available. Um, once packages are loaded, they appear as just ordinary GoKB packages. Feedback process, well, let, let's, let's look at it and then uh, it'll be clear. So here we've got, um, a standard screen that the, the, the GoKB data managers pardon me, are used to seeing. Usually, when we load a package in Google Refine, um, if we see a publisher we've never seen before, for example, we'll add that as an organization, and that will generate a review request that says in here, um, loading this data file causes us to create a new organization of Fred's publisher. Can you just make sure that's right, please, and that it's not a duplicate of something else? 
um, and then the data manager could go in here and, and check out the data and say, yeah, that's all that's all fine. We've we've taken that mechanism then and just basically added a new class of um, review request, and the the class of review request is an ingest failed. Basically, you you need to help us out with this file because we don't know how to make it consistent. So Jennifer comes into work, uh, clicks on on the link. You, you can see I've used the the cause search here to just get the ingest. Um, uh, review for requests. There's, there's actually quite a few other records in this database. So we click on this, which takes us through to the, the page for looking at the review request. And what that does is list all the problems that we've encountered whilst we were trying to load that package file. And this is the, this is the one that we see most often. As it happens, this, this is for a serial, uh, but that's okay. So the inconsistent title identifier exception can happen when um, a few weeks ago, I saw a title with an identifier, and I've just seen the same identifier in the new file, but the title in it is wildly different uh, to the one that I've already got in the database. I don't know if that's because the title I loaded two weeks ago was wrong, or the new one's wrong, or actually it's right, it's just that somebody's used a really wild abbreviation, so you should, you should allow that. As, a, as an alternate name. So the options that we're being given at the moment is, actually, you know, this, this isn't the same title. Um, you're going to need to create a new title record for this and don't try and overload the one you've already got. Don't use the same identifier. Uh, just create me a new title and, and map it as best you can. Or you can say, actually, it's just a wild uh, abbreviation, for example, so add this as a variant. This really is the same item. You don't ever need to bother about this again. The the rule base is um, working at different levels, and the idea is that having said add this as a variant, we'll never see this exception again. So, in particular with the case of variant names, even if we saw the same case from another identifier, we'd say, you know, the odds are that this title is just a variant because we've got it added as a variant title. So we shouldn't see this case come up again in that in that ingest process. Obviously, uh, if we see a subtly different abbreviation tomorrow, then that's going to be a new thing that a user is going to have to, to look at. We've experimented with different levels of aggressive normalization for that. Um, and some of it works really well. Uh, some of it less so. There's a particular problem with hyphenation and spacing, uh, which is difficult to get right. So I think we're always going to need a human at this level to, to say, this is how you make sense of, of the stuff, because machines are just really bad at that kind of thing. So this mechanism is, uh, the ingest process doesn't understand how to fix this. Please tell us, uh, and then we'll, we'll try and remember for next time. So the, the lesson learned, I guess, and I, and I think this is this is a lesson we've learned in the path of GoKB, because when we started out down GoKB, we were really interested in the idea of reusable rules. In, in that expert systems tradition, representation is king. It's important you get the representation right. Um, and I think the, the mistake we probably made with this piece of work originally was we were looking at rules engines and we dived into rules engines before we'd figured out what the representation of the knowledge was, if you like. Um, so having gone through this process now and having come up with a representation for the rules, actually I think we're in a better position to go back and look again at the automation of these of these things. Um, and we've got a rules engine that, that is working now. But we might be in a position to go and go for one of those really off-the-shelf rules engines like Drawls now, now that we've figured out exactly what the representation is. Um, so the, the kind of this is a fake example, and it's a little bit abstracted to take some of the, the gnarliness away. But in essence, it's a very simple JSON structure that says, when these conditions are true, then this is how you deal with it. So when, when you've got an inconsistent title identifier, and the title is environmental geology, and the ISBN is this, Inconsistent title identifier will happen because I've got something with this identifier and a wildly different title. Then I can say, uh, actually, the response to that is, we know that this, uh, this vendor is a 
I nearly swore then, uh, is known for sending us the wrong identifier with this title. Actually, the way to do this is to correct the identifier and it's 10, uh, 0106 rather than 0105. So that would be an example of correct the identifier. This rule is set up as a general rule. We could add the vendor here. So we could say, when all this happens, and the vendor is Wiley. So I'm not picking on Wiley, just uh, that's the example at the, the fore of my mind. Um, so we could scope when this rule applies, but it it seems to us, and you know, willing to to be absolutely talked out of this, that the odds are, if I get a title from Elsevier that matches this, that this is likely to be valid as well. Um, so I'm not sure that adding the you know the source actually helps us here, because if these conditions are true then yeah, that, that's likely to be the solution. Uh, another example is obviously a little bit like the one I was just talking where we've got some provider and we've got an inconsistent title identifier, but the title's MV Geology. Uh, actually, this is a bit of a bogus example because we could probably work out that that's an abbreviation and, and not even bother Jennifer, but I, I think we would. I think we'd like to. Uh, we can say, you know what? That's just a valid alternate title. So, ooh, sorry. Uh, that's just a valid alternate title. So what all we do in this case is to add M Geology as a, as a variant title, standard GoKB variant title, and then we'd never see this error again, uh, no matter how often we encountered M Geology against environmental geology. Um, so that's how we load the data. But the, the really interesting thing is how do you um, how do you surface that for users? So here we've got a package which has been loaded uh, from ScienceDirect, and it's just the standard GoKB package display. Uh, so I've scrolled down a little bit, so we're focusing on the titles, but you can see we've got package details. This package has got just 57 titles in it. Uh, all the other standard GoKB titles. Here's the decision support tab that's been added, and then we've got this new tab as well called activity. So the package is just an ordinary GoKB package. It just happens to be updated uh, on a nightly basis by this process. If I go to the activity tab, then you can see what I've got here is a historic list of what's been happening. And this is the thing, it's trying to give me an impression of the churn in the package. And you can see that, that uh, we, we kicked this update off yesterday. And that yesterday, uh, there were a fair few titles removed from this package. As I scroll down, there's a fair few added as well. Um, but you can see that there's quite a lot of churn going on. Um, I'm looking at a different package here than the one I was on the previous screen, sorry. Uh, so this package has got 18, oh, 1,800 titles in it. But, but still, that's quite a lot to be, to be adding and removing. Um, we've looked at coming up with a number, and I don't think we've ever really agreed on a, on a good way of working out a number that represents the churn of package as a percentage, perhaps, so additions and removals. I'll, I'll uh, go, to, go to the live app in a second. Um, just one thing to note is obviously all the removes are the most recent ones. The way that we know something is removed, and the only way we know something is removed, is that the last time we loaded the package, a load of stuff that was there previously isn't there anymore. So the removes always come after the additions because the only way we know that something's been removed is we've got to the end of the file and something that was there two, two days ago isn't there anymore. Uh, so that, that's how we're detecting removals. We're not getting messages from the, uh, the vendor saying, hey, we've taken X Ways Forensics Practitioner's Guide out of the package. Uh, you know, we're looking at the package file and saying, you know, X Ways Forensic Practitioner's Guide isn't in this package anymore, and it was two days ago. Uh, so that's the way that this is working. Um, ultimately, people still seem to just use this like GoKB. You just go in and look at the titles. And the activity thing people people look at when they're you know when they're first evaluating this and oh look at all the packages titles coming and going, you know, and they get a bit excised about it. But um it's not really convenient to be able to or to have to uh, come to this screen every morning and say Look, I happen to know that thermosets and composites is really important to my institution and it's been removed. So the, the thing which really people got 
into was this idea of it turns out that um, thermosets and composites is really important. It's on my reading list um, for a particular course. And I need to know if that vanishes. So we came up with the idea of watch lists. And watch lists are where institutions can upload lists of titles using this kind of reading list format. And if they're subscribed to a watch list, they'll get an email every morning that says, did you know that a title on your watch list has either been added or removed? And I'll just talk through this a little bit because it's, we need to do some more work on, on the presentation here. Uh, everything is a hyperlink through to GoKB. So it's a bit tricky because it looks like there's lots of duplicate stuff here, but it's really not. Um, what we've got is the watch list name. So this is the Biosciences One watch list, which is owned by University of JISC. And on that watch list, we've got Ganong's review of medical physiology. The thing in the watch list is a print edition of this book, uh, because it's actually, I've borrowed this from the high demand print use book at the University of York. That has mapped onto a particular work in the database. So obviously, this might be the first edition. Uh, so we've got a generic work, which all editions will come under, all electronic or, like, or physical versions will fall under. And then we've got a match title. Uh, this might be the same, but it's unlikely to be, especially not if this is a print item. So what we're likely to have here is an electronic version of this text has become available and you wanted to know about that. So although we've got a print item in the watch list, the match title is, is something which is matched by sorry tying myself in knots. The match title is an electronic edition of the print item. We've then got a link to the tip so we can tell which package it was in. And then we've got this package link so I can go straight to the package if I want. Um, you can tell here that this is me testing because actually this text isn't available electronically. I'm just inventing stuff. So I've, I've made a fake electronic version of this text to test this particular feature. Um, so this is, this is good because if I'm doing collection weeding, and this is something that, you know, there are 20 copies of this on my shelves and suddenly it's available electronically. I can start making some interesting decisions then about uh, how I, you know, how I let students and staff access that text. That's a pretty serious use case for this. Uh, the the, the e-resource librarians are quite keen on this. Just go down to the next one uh, because the, this shows a different issue. You can see from the uh, from the scroll bar, this, is, this turned out to be quite a long email. Uh, there's a lot of changes overnight. And what we've got here is biotechnology for waste and wastewater treatment. And this title, uh, so this looks like a Wiley title to me, I think. Um, this title has obviously been added to a load of packages, which means I've been told about each occurrence of this thing that I'm interested in. I still kind of trying to find feedback about whether that's useful or not. Um, it, it's difficult because it's good because if, if you subscribe to this package, you'll instantly recognize it perhaps and you'll say, oh, wow, I should have access to that. Um, but at the same time, it's a lot of noise, especially if a title has been added to, you know, 10 or 20 or, or 50 packages. So there's, there's some interesting challenges with this still. Um, but that's uh, that's the way that that works. Talk a little bit. I don't have any screenshots of watch lists. So I'll just talk about that. Um, this idea of. Oh, I've hey, Ian. Oh, yes. Hello. There's a couple questions that came in if you want to. Go for it. Uh, Paul, so um, somebody wanted to know, uh, do we load records for individual titles as well as packages? And then what system are these being loaded into? Right, so we could load individual titles. Um, I mean, we'd, we'd be loading a package of one title in some ways. Uh, interestingly, on the reading list, um, if we ingest a reading list and, oh, sorry, a watch list, and the watch list contains a title not already in the system, then it will create a title for that item in the watch list. Uh, so we're basically putting a marker in which lets us detect 
you know, if it subsequently becomes available, because of course, GoKB is unlikely to have records for print-only titles uh, that have come from any vendor imports. Uh, so you're always going to be talking about a title that GoKB probably hasn't seen yet. Um, but right. Yeah. And and just to clarify too, because I think this might be the intent of the question, when we load in these packages, it creates a package record and a record for each individual title. So for the packages we're loading, we do have title records. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, the, the GoKB-ness of all this means that if I subsequently load a second package that references that title, I'll be referring to the title I created previously. Yeah, and I think um, one other thing maybe just for clarification when I was looking at the question is like some of the packages that are going into GoKB, it doesn't necessarily mean you buy the titles at the package no. level. So like there could be a package that would be like all Wiley eBooks and you could select individual eBooks that you've chosen to buy. So, so I think the terminology of package is not necessarily how they're sold. Would that be accurate to say? Yeah, I mean a lot of them, a lot of them do represent groups that you might purchase together, but there are exceptions, things like what we call a master list, which basically is just every single book or journal that a certain vendor sells, so that if you had a custom collection, you could use that master list to sort of pick out the things that made up your collection. Okay, any more? Um, yeah, so there, oh, actually there's a whole bunch coming in now, so. Um, People are sick of me monologuing, I'm <laughs> sick of me monologuing, so that's good. Well, this one is just feedback, which maybe is useful, um, where somebody said knowing all the different platforms is useful. Um, I think this is in reference to the email alerts, but could probably be collapsed. Oh, cool. Thank you. So maybe having some sort of like show more or grouping things together that are similar. Yeah. Um, and then uh, someone also followed up and said, have we considered dealing with chapter level metadata? Which I think the answer is not yet, but we know that that is probably something that is going to be needed at some point. Yeah, it's uh, it's worth just pointing. The, the, the GoKB mo uh, data model is based on this thing called parts explosion, uh, which is a pretty well-known pattern, and that was chosen specifically because it would allow us to do that kind of thing, although, yeah, we've never done it yet. But in theory, the data model does it. Right, so we could always expand to that in the future, but it is also, you know, if there's several million eBooks that exist, then how many chapters are there? So, you know, it does add like a huge layer of complexity on to, so we would, you know, have to evaluate how to do that. But I do think that chapter and article level metadata is kind of like the next wave of data that someone is going to have to address. Yeah. Okay, I think you're good to move on. Cool, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, ne I'm nearly reaching the end, so uh, thank you for sticking with it, everyone. Um, okay, so watch lists. Um, there was a there were some interesting discussions about users collaborating and subject areas collaborating. So watch lists, um, people wanted to be able to share them. Basically, uh, let me quickly go here. Log in. Time down. So this uh, this alternate dashboard, which uh, which is different to the standard GoKB dashboard. Um, Users now can be members of, of organizational groups, and that could be the institution, or it could be a subject specialist group within the institution. It, it could actually be my, my group of one, um, but watch lists are owned by groups, uh, and that's the way you share. And people can be invited into groups by the group owner. So uh, obviously I've got a knowledge integration group here, and I can invite people into it, um, and I'm members of different groups. All these universities, uh, all the lists are here, and I can subscribe to them. So the uh, the University of York Health Library is uh, is a list here, and so there are 553 uh, titles, and the, these are the titles which are very important to the, the health library for the University of York. We've got uh, this is the, the the watch list. 
this is very crude, and we need to uh, we need to do some some nice Google uh, graph representations of this. But what this is telling us is that there are 553 uh, titles in this watch list. 14 of those, though, are actually available as uh, as electronic text somewhere out there. So. The University of York have uploaded a title watch list of print items uh, saying, please, can you have a look for these? And we've actually managed to hit 14 print, uh, sorry, 14 electronic items that we've, we've managed to crawl from the different vendors. So that's, I mean, that's interesting. It's not, it's not earth shattering, but that, that's, we, we found something out there that we perhaps didn't know before. And I happen to know that if I page through 12 pages, I think, there we go. Uh, hey, so that's, Ian. Yes. A question on the watch list. Um, can one group have multiple watch lists? Like yes. if you had a watch list things we want to buy or class reserves that we're just making sure they don't disappear? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, opening a new tab. Um, yes, absolutely. So if, if University of York had, if we wanted to have one called High Demand Print or uh, sorry, I've already forgotten what the examples were. Uh, but yeah, they would just be listed here as different lists under the University of York. Yeah, uh, pretty much a key requirement that I suspect uh, because different people want to curate lists in different ways. Uh, oh, okay. oh, so 14. So that, that 14 on the availability tab, um, it means that there are 14 rows in this thing where this is this is one or more. So it's not relating to this 14, that's just an unfortunate coincidence. Um, there are 14 titles where they're available somewhere in the package. And if I go to uh, geometric morphometrics for biologists, here we go. Uh, so we're into pretty standard GoKB land now. Uh, standard properties, and if we look at availability, we'll see these are all the packages where uh, we, we've encountered this particular title. So that's quite nice. Uh, you know, we, we can see that they're all on Science Direct, obviously. Um, so that's the way that's working. Um, if I go to this, so we've got the titles, we've got something that we'd like to make into a pretty graph that I haven't had time yet. This is the place where I can basically upload a new um, a new file containing new titles, or I can update the titles that are on this watch list. If we go to uh, the GoKB wiki, uh, you can see this is basically the, the the title list format. So it's really easy for us to join systems together. As long as you can spit out tab separated files that contain these headers, um, there's an example of what one looks like. Uh, then we can load it as a watch list, and you can start getting your emails uh, that, that say what's uh, you know, what's been added and removed. There's a few. Uh, I'll, I'll very quickly go over this, but I had to talk about it uh, just because I find it exciting. Um, when we were looking at matching uh, instances back to works, so I guess you've all seen. There's no CLC paper on how a CLC do this sort of thing. Um, we were looking at a project called Dedupe, which is a Hadoop project aimed at deduplicating large collections of works. And uh, they're doing some really interesting work. And it, the problem we've got when, when we're loading this data is that um, if atmospheric geology, to just invent a, a, a new title, um, if it's in two packages, it's very difficult to parallelize that work because if, if the two streams of work both encounter that title at the same moment, we end up with two copies of it in the database, and that's death for a knowledge base. Because as soon as you've got two, well, we know this from previous versions of GoKB, uh, as soon as you go from where you've got one canonical copy to having many, or more than one, i.e. two, uh, you're in a position where you can't decide which one of those two you should be using. And the consistency thing I talked about earlier on has gone out the window. Uh, that, that problem makes parallelizing this, this ingest quite hard. Um, but in borrowing from the DJU project, the way that that works is fundamentally by building a hash. So we take the title and the subtitle and some other properties, hash them all together, normalize them, hash them together, and then put them in a bucket where we try and figure out whether it matches anything else in the bucket. And uh, my, my colleague, Mark, who's working on Folio, very quickly 
twigged that that was the mechanism by which we could parallelize this. So we thought we'd done really well um, getting to uh, 100,000 titles an hour on the ingest. Um, and it turns out this mechanism actually lets us scale it um, almost linearly, well, actually linearly. Uh, so we could just add another ingest machine and we could divide the work up. That becomes quite interesting in terms of uh, how we reprocess the knowledge base, how we repopulate the knowledge base if we change the rules for deduplication. So there's some quite interesting things going on here uh, and uh, get quite excited about that. That's a, an, interesting, an interesting aside. Just as we make the transition or we think about um, making the transition from a, a pilot into a, a live service, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, this mapping from titles to works is the linchpin of, of the alerting. It has to work well. And actually, it's, it's working very well. Uh, we've tested it with some, some data sets that were manually deduplicated, and we're getting a really good match. We're up in the 99%, but there are always edge cases. And, and so this is something we have to keep an eye on. And uh, I suspect it will be a constantly evolving uh, part of the work. The, the rules sharing, uh, we've been doing some other, other work in the UK uh, with large aggregated collections. It turns out it's really cool if you can share those rules about how to deduplicate and how to deal with the error cases. So uh, when we flag up to Jennifer that we got that title that was inconsistent and we've come back with an answer saying it's actually not inconsistent, it's just a ridiculous abbreviation, you're okay to go with it. Um, recording that fact and making that data available as open data turns out to be really cool because it means if somebody else wants to ingest that data for some completely different reason, they're going to they're encounter exactly the same consistency problem. And if you've made it available as open data, you know they, they can clean their data up as well. And then you can figure out you're both talking about the same title or not. Um, so that's a really interesting part of GoKB. And if we can make that part of the knowledge base open, then there's something quite interesting happening there because currently the knowledge bases which are out there, uh, obviously the, the knowledge which has gone into making the data consistent is their USP. It, it's the proprietary part of the service. And in some ways, it, if you've got that knowledge, you can make a knowledge base yourself. Um, so th there's a really interesting thing about the openness of that data, I think. So uh, participation. Uh, uh, Jennifer and Kristen asked me if I could just say something about this. Um, we've got to the pretty much the end of the trial period, if you like, and we're just doing a write-up. We're, we're asking the users what they thought, um, asking them anymore. They seem to be very, very keen on it. What seems to be happening is that the idea that decision support might fit better with, um, so in the UK we have a shared ERM system that that universities can use. There's a feeling that decision support might fit better in that app than in the, the knowledge base. I think there's a strong feeling that availability tracking belongs in the knowledge base um, and that the, the connection between what I showed you with the, the watch lists and the package loading, that's so go KB that I can't imagine we'll want to do that sort of thing anywhere else. Um, but obviously, we have to present our findings back to JISC, and JISC will say, yeah, we, we think uh, availability tracking should stay in GoKB, and we think decision support might be better in KB+, for example. Uh, so those decisions are, are due in, in, the, in the very near future. However, uh, it's open source software. We have no intention of taking uh, ebooksTrial.kn.com is where the, the trial has been hosted. We're not going to take it down. If anybody wants to play, uh, drop an S a message to Jennifer and Kristen, and you'd be very welcome. It's it's a sandbox. It's not production, so uh, don't use it expecting, uh, you know, expecting data to be there the next day. But if you want to play, uh, you would be very welcome. Uh, I think you'll all be pleased to know that that's me at the end of my slides. Um, any questions or comments or thoughts? Um, I'd encourage people to type their questions in the question box. And um, I have a question for you. Um, 
and just for clarification, Kristen Wilson is um, the Kristen you want to contact versus Kristen Martin, which is me. Um, it gets confusing. But my question is, uh, this is based on some experience with other knowledge bases. Um, sometimes, like the the vendors or the publishers mess up in their data information. So, you know, like seeing like titles that are added and removed, like um, sometimes they're providing the same information but in a different way that's causing the knowledge base to think that a new title has been added and another title has been removed. Um, I'm wondering what you might be doing to try to control for that like messiness of data so that you don't just get unnecessary churn when everything is actually more stable. So I don't think we have any choice about, I mean, if there was a row in a, in a, in a package file um, where it was something with that identifier was there one day and it was gone the next, um, we wouldn't really have any choice about flagging that as a removal. Um, if it's been replaced by something else, that's a removal and an addition, and I guess what you're asking is can we, can we tie those two things together and maybe collapse them? Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, like the examples that I, that we've experienced is like we're told an ebook has been removed from a package, and then it just reappears like a day later. Sure, sure. Um, no, I mean, we currently we would report that as a removal and an addition. But of course, the way that it works means that if you were to run the import on a weekly basis, um, you wouldn't see that because the, if the thing came back. Um, it could disappear and reappear as many times as it wanted in between us checking. Um, so I guess one of one of the things we could do is to change the frequency that we harvest. But of course the problem is that there'll always be a there'll always be something wrong the day before you harvest. And and by lengthening the gap, um, you're making it a week before you'll figure out that something that went on Friday came back on Monday the following week. So I don't know that we have a good answer for that yet. Um, no, we're exposing the full horror of things coming and going at the moment. Do you have any ideas? I don't know. I was trying to think if there would be a way to use rules if you find out, I guess, if there's one provider that's more unstable compared with another. Yeah, I mean, so what could we do? I mean, actually, now, now I think about it, I guess what we could do is we could have a um, some kind of sedentary period where we don't report changes until, if we see a change on Monday, we don't report the change until everything's been stable for a few days. But, you know, it's like, yeah, this title is removed and it stayed removed for, for five for five days, so therefore we're going to report it now. Um, I don't know how we'd handle that in, in terms of tracking it, but it sounds like it could be doable. Do you think that would help? So yeah, we'll not be reporting it immediately. Sorry, come. Yeah, it might help. Yeah, so just, just introduce a little bit of lag into the reporting. Yeah, and I didn't know yeah. if you'd experienced any of that with your work so far. Oh, we have. I've got to be, if I'm really honest, you know, um, that's played to our favor because people go, oh, shock and horror at titles disappearing. And I suspect we've played up to that a little bit. Uh, and maybe that's a bit dishonest of us, uh, especially if, if what's really happening is what you're describing. It's just a mistake. Well, Kristen, uh, oh, if I can jump in, I'll also just say, I mean, part of GoKB has also always been intended to be the community management aspect. So. If people see, oh, this ebook disappeared, but I went to my package and I could still get to it, then that's something where we as a community can try to work with vendors. Because I mean, I think part of this has to do not just with what we can do within GoKB, but like what can we do to work directly at, with publishers at the top of the supply chain to help them do better in the first place. And so, you know, there may be better ways to communicate or do those types of things, but I think that's a an, an component too. Yeah, um, and Cornell is saying maybe there could even be like a custom setting if you want to have a lag. So um, if, if you know that a title list from a publisher is always problematic, maybe you don't worry about it because you know your access is straightforward or maybe you wouldn't want to have that because otherwise, you know, that could slow down any troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there, there is another question I want to make sure we talk about this because this may be confusing as this is the Folio forum about like the relationship between GoKB and Folio and, and how these products may end up working together. So at this point, this decision support and availability tracking is not part of Folio, but Folio is, there's actually not a lot that's actually been developed outside of the base platform and so development is going on. And maybe, maybe Ian, you could talk about if you're thinking about how this could interface with the Folio LSP. Sure. Um, so Folio is evolving a data model which is different to the one that underpins GoKB. Um, not in a bad way. Uh, it has some modular requirements, which mean we couldn't just lift GoKB and drop it into Folio. Uh, but the, the functional thinking and the functionality of GoKB are really at the fore of our minds in, in designing what's going into, into Folio. So there's a logical connection, but it won't be a case of, of dragging and dropping the code. Um, there's also a connection at the service level, though, which is that I think we, we have a strong suspicion that uh, Folio would like to be able to integrate with knowledge-based services. And uh, Mark and I have said, you know, we can build it to just use one knowledge base. Uh, EBSCO maybe have a knowledge base they would like us to integrate with. But in order to prove the open part of it, we, we really should integrate with more than one. If you can integrate with two, then you know that you've got your interfaces right. And I, I think the thing that we'd really like to do is to treat GoKB as another possible source of, of knowledge base data for Folio. But I'm, I'm speaking very much for myself and not the project there. Yeah, and also just to clarify to GoKB as it is right now is kind of a standalone data project. So you can go to gokb.org and find information about how to sign up for an account and you can actually get in and use the current GoKB system. It doesn't include this ebook functionality right now since this is just a pilot, but it does include a number of journal packages that you can browse um, and look at the data. You can access the data through an API and you can also do like um, exports just kind of into an Excel file of different packages. So right now it's just kind of like the data is out there. People can go and use it for anything that they want to use it for. And then, yeah, as Ian said, um, we're hoping, you know, that there could be some experimentation with Folio either to use GoKB directly or for those of us who are participating in Folio on the SIGs and other groups, if there's things that we're seeing in GoKB or any other system that we like, I think we can give that feedback that these are features we'd like to see be part of Folio in some way. Definitely. Um, I have another question for you and your work on this project. I know there are some vendors that are, um, that are supplying in this case, it happens to be entitlements, which wouldn't necessarily be what, what um, GoKB is doing, but like Elsevier and JSTOR are sort of providing an automated um, knowledge base updating service for customers. And I know you'd mentioned like with Wiley, you go out and are collecting things from uh, an FTP site. Are you, have you found vendors where you're able, where they're able to sort of like communicate maybe via an API or something to automatically push their updates into GoKB? I've not encountered that yet. Uh, to, to be, I don't know, this, this may be unfair. Uh, FTP and talking to a website as though you're a user is uh, high levels of technology. <laughs> uh, I've not seen any APIs pushing data to us yet. Um, part of me suspects that GoKB uh, itself might be a great adapter for uh, sucking data out of FTP sites and turning that into some kind of webhooks type forwarding and alerting service. Um, I suspect if the community has a need for push-based services, we would get a lot more traction by making OKB read the FTP site and then 
go KB, do the on push, and waiting for vendors to to implement that sort of feature. But uh, I, they might release something tomorrow. You never know. Um, but I've not seen anything like that so far. All right. Thanks. We are getting near the end of time. If, um, if anybody has a last question they'd like to ask, type it in the question box. I'll wait for just a moment longer. Yeah, and while we're waiting, I'll just um, let me just say again that if you want more information about GoKB or any of what uh, we talked about today, just go to gokb.org. That's probably your best and easiest to remember starting place. And there's information there about signing up for an account and contacting uh, Jennifer, and she can, you know, get you to the right place and help you get accounts set up and all of that. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any last question coming in, so I'd just like to thank everybody for participating in the Folio Forum and um, thank Kristen and Ian and Jennifer and everybody who's asked questions and has participated. So I hope this has been useful and um, you'll continue to be involved through future forums or any other parts of the project. And go to gokb.org again if you are interested in, in finding out more about this. And um, if you're thinking about how this could be integrated in with your new open source LSP, this could be a great opportunity to also work on the Folio project. So information for our next forum is still being finalized, but we should be getting it, that out hopefully this week. Uh, it'll be in about two weeks. Uh, and we did record this, and that recording will be posted to the Open Library website. It, usually we get it up within a day or so. Um, and that's basically it. So thank you again. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone who came. All right. Hey. We'll talk to you later. Okay, goodbye. Bye.